So, did the Ottomans really fight the Aztecs in Southeast Asia? Let's learn more! Mabuhay or in Kapampangan, Luwid Kayu. Welcome back to my channel. It's me, Kirby Aralio, your friendly Pinoy historian. And if you're new to my channel, in this channel, I make videos about our people's history, our people's culture, traditions, and everything in between from the Philippines, throughout Southeast Asia, and throughout the diaspora. So don't forget to like, share this video, comment down below, and please subscribe. And today's topic, as requested by my viewers and patrons, I'm doing a reaction to the video Aztecs vs. Ottomans in Southeast Asia by Jabzi. And as usual, we'll break it down from my perspective as a Southeast Asian historian and a culture bearer. And also as someone who happens to be a descendant of those involved in this war. So without further ado, let's begin! So in the first second of the video, he mentioned that the Ottomans did not try to colonize the Americas. That's actually false because they actually did. The Ottomans tried, but it was too difficult for them to continue their attempts given both the geographic location and the political context of the time. It was more lucrative for them and more productive for them to focus their attention and their resources towards their influence and presence in the Indian Ocean and Southeast Asia. And the channel Kings and Generals actually made a good video about this just last year, so check it out after this video. And then in the video Ottomans versus the Aztecs, he talks about how the Spaniards wanted to expand their colonies in Asia, like in their attempt to conquer Cambodia in 1583. They wanted to take advantage of the chaos during King Nereswan of Ayutthaya's invasion of the Kamai Kingdom of Longvec in what is now Cambodia. He talked about how the Spanish forces included Filipinos and Japanese mercenaries and how this was a strange alliance against 100,000 Siamese warriors. But this was actually not that strange, at least for the so-called Filipinos and Japanese. The Luzonist warriors of Luzon in what is now the Philippines and the warriors from Japan have already been part of the many wars in this region. In fact, the Kingdom of Luzon was an ally of the Sukhothai dynasty of Ayudaya. Nareswan's own father and grandfather sought the help of the Luzonist warriors to defend Ayudaya against the Burmese invasions. Actually, I made a short video about this, the Luzonist warriors in Ayudaya, several years ago. So if you haven't seen it yet, check it out after this video. Or let me know in the comments if you want me to expand and make an updated version of this video. The old one was only 5 minutes, so yeah, let me know in the comments. But anyways, multi-ethnic forces were not new. Ayutthayan forces throughout history included warriors from Japan, Luzon, Champa, and others. In the video, he also mentioned the epic encounter between the Japanese pirates and the Spanish conquistadors in the battles of Cagayan. But did you know that it was not really the Spaniards who defeated the Woku pirates? And you can learn more about this in a video that I made just a few weeks ago. So make sure to watch it after this video. There's actually an English and a Tagalog version. Now, this so-called encounter between the Ottomans against the Aztecs actually happened during a war between the Kingdom of Spain or the Conquistadors against the Sultanate of Brunei back in 1578 and this is known as the Castilian War. He mentioned how Brunei was a forgotten colonial empire. So yes, by the 1520s, Brunei had emerged as the dominant power in Southeast Asia, especially after the fall of the Sultanate of Malacca in 1511. And this also coincides with Brunei's golden age from the 15th century to the 17th century. He also talked about how the Spaniards allied themselves with the Kingdom of Manila and the Sultanate of Sulu to conquer Manila in 1571. Now, this is actually confusing. I mean, it does not make sense for the Kingdom of Manila to ally itself with the invading Spanish Spaniards to conquer Manila itself. It would also not make sense for the Sultanate of Sulu to help an invasion of Manila by the Europeans, by the Christians. He also mentioned that Sulu and Manila were vassals of Brunei. Now, the feudal term vassal is also somewhat Eurocentric. The geopolitics of Southeast Asia during this time was a bit more complicated. You know, there was a lot of overlapping sovereignties and overlapping, you know, interwoven webs of alliances. And, you know, these terms don't necessarily apply to Southeast Asia. They were not colonies of Brunei, but they were also not necessarily vassals. These Eurocentric terms, colonies, vassals, don't necessarily apply to the situation in Southeast Asia. So instead, they were within the Sultanate of Brunei's sphere of influence, or what many scholars today call the Mandala, mostly because the royal families of Sulu, Brunei, and Manila or Luzon were actually related to one another. The Sultan of Brunei during this time in 1571, Sultan Saiful Rijal, was actually the cousin of both the Sultan of Sulu, Sultan Muhammad Ul Halim, aka Pengiran Budiman, and of my own direct ancestor, Raja Matanda of Manila, aka Raja Muhammad or Raja 
Raja Aceh, who many considered to be the paramount king of Luzon when the conquistadors arrived in the 1560s. So in short, when the conquistadors arrived, the sovereign rulers of Brunei, Sulu, and Manila or Luzon were all cousins. They were all the grandchildren of the mighty Sultan Bolkiah of Brunei and the much revered and beloved Putri Lelementionai of Sulu. And although closely related by blood and through political alliances, these kingdoms were pretty much independent of one another, while at the same time, to certain degrees, they were also interdependent to one another. So it was more complicated than simply calling them vassals. You know, so basically, calling them vassals is like saying that Germany was a vassal of the British Empire in 1888 just because the Emperor of Germany was the grandson of Queen Victoria of the United Kingdom, or that Spain was a vassal of France in the 1700s just because the Bourbon King of Spain was the grandson of the Sun King, Louis XIV of France. So I actually made a video about the epic royal wedding and the legendary love story of my ancestors, Sultan Bolkiah and Putri Lele Menchanai. I made two versions of this, one in English and one in Tagalog, so if you haven't seen them yet, check them out after this video. So now, let's fast forward to what led to the Spanish invasion of Brunei in 1578. So in the video, he mentioned the Reconquista mentality of the Spaniards and the spreading of Christianity in Manila and Cebu and how this, he said, obviously angered Brunei. But while Brunei was pretty angry about the fall of Manila to the Spaniards in 1571, it was actually more of Spain's insecurities in the Philippines that led to their invasion of Brunei. The Spaniards knew and they actually admitted themselves that their newly established colonies in the Visayas and in Luzon would not remain in Spanish hands while Brunei's power continued to grow. They decided long before this invasion that they must eliminate the Sultanate of Brunei to expand their own Spanish ambition of conquering more colonies in Asia. You know, it is also wrong to assume that Brunei during this time was intolerant towards Christianity. In fact, way before the Spaniards conquered Cebu in 1565 or Manila in 1571, Brunei actually allowed the passage of Christian missionaries in the region decades before the Spanish conquest of the Philippines. They allowed Christian missionaries to preach freely as a token of friendship with the Europeans. And you know, instead of banning them, instead of banishing them from the islands of Borneo and what is now the Philippines, the Sultanate of Brunei focused more on increasing its support and resources towards the growth of Islam in the region. So in short, they were not angry that there were Christians within their islands, but instead, they were actually more tolerant than the Europeans. They simply matched the arrival of Christian missionaries with increasing their own Muslim missionaries. And this was in stark contrast with the Spanish demand demands in 1576 and 1578. So in 1576, the new Spanish governor of the Philippines, Francisco de Sande, demanded that the Sultan of Brunei must allow the spreading of Christianity in Borneo while at the same time gave an ultimatum to the Sultan that Brunei should stop spreading Islam in the Philippines. See the difference? So as we can see, it was the Spaniards who were intolerant of other religions, especially Islam, and thus igniting a bitter competition, a bitter conflict with Brunei, and centuries of war against the Muslim kingdoms and sultanates of Southeast Asia, especially in Sulu and Mindanao. And this is exactly what De Sande wanted to happen when he arrived in Brunei in 1578. He said that he came in peace, but what he really wanted was war. And so in March of 1578, a squadron of 40 warships left Manila, sailing towards Brunei. It is also important to know that this so-called Spanish Armada against Brunei included indigenous warships from the Philippines. And these were most likely Caracoas. And as mentioned in my previous videos, unknown to many Filipinos, despite being colonized by Spain, the Kapampangans of Luzon were still able to maintain their own navy and independent merchant fleet up until the 17th century. And yes, this invading Spanish forces was multi-ethnic. It was made up of hundreds of Spaniards, hundreds of Bruneans, hundreds of Mexicans, and over 1,500 native Moros of Luzon and the Visayans from the Philippines. And they arrived in Cotabato, the old capital of Brunei, in April 1578. And despite their claims of coming to negotiate peace, the Spaniards under the Sande were eager for war. And if we look closely, their demands were not peaceful at 
at all. These demands were meant to intentionally provoke the Sultan of Brunei. And this Sunday used this as an excuse to launch an attack against the 50 Brunei warships nearby. And this led to chaos. And in this chaos and fierce battle, the Sultan of Brunei actually ordered the burning of the capital. And this is interesting, especially for Filipinos, because almost the same exact thing happened eight years before when the Spaniards invaded Manila in 1570. When Raja Matanda's heir, Raja Sulaiman, aka the Raja Muda of Manila, was said to have ordered the burning of the pre-colonial walled city of Manila. So, for those who are wondering, why would they burn their own cities, their own capitals? This was actually a pretty common tactic in these islands. A common tactic of our ancestors. When necessary, they would burn their own cities as they retreat to destroy anything that might be useful to the enemies. And just like in the attack of Brunei's capital in 1578, the Spaniards also claimed to have come in peace, but somehow ended up invading and pillaging Manila in 1570. And so just like in Manila, the Spaniards pillaged Cotabato in 1578. And in this pillaging, the Spaniards looted both treasures and weapons from Brunei. In fact, among these stolen treasures included 10 magnificently carved doors from the richly gilded Grand Mosque of Brunei. And this old mosque also had a splendid five-tier roof similar to the pre-colonial and traditional architecture of the Philippines and Southeast Asia. And the Spaniards were astonished by the beauty of this grand mosque before burning it to the ground and looting its treasures. And actually, these intricately carved doors that were stolen from the mosque of Brunei were brought back to Manila and they were installed in some of Manila's oldest Catholic churches like San Agustin. And they also used the materials from the grand palace of the Sultan of Brunei to build the old Manila Cathedral. And again, this was similar to how the Spanish walled city of Intramuros de Manila was actually itself built using the materials from the grand pre-colonial royal palaces and the fortress of the Rajas of Manila. Intramuros was literally built above the ashes of the pre-colonial walled city of Manila. And these looted treasures like the magnificently carved doors would actually survive fires and earthquakes through the centuries until the tragic rape of Manila in World War II when they were all lost forever. When Manila itself was burned to the ground. And back in Brunei in 1578, another thing that was lost forever because of this invasion was the golden tablet that was engraved with the royal genealogy of the early sultans of Brunei and their links to the different kingdoms of Southeast Asia including Luzon. The Spaniards marveled at the prosperity and how immense wealthy the capital of Brunei was. After all, Brunei was at the heart of a flourishing trade network with the many kingdoms and empires of Asia and beyond from places like China, Siam, India, Japan, Luzon, Java, and many more. Immediately after the battle, the Sultan and the people of Cotabato retreated to the mountains and to the other port cities along the west coast of Borneo in places like what is now Sarawak. And as soon as the dust settled, the Spaniards hastily built fortifications but their desire to conquer Borneo failed. The Spaniards were quickly decimated by diseases and they realized how difficult it would be to conquer the Sultanate of Brunei. And so over a thousand warriors of Brunei led by the prince Pengiran Bendahara Sakam ibn Sultan Abdul Kahar delivered the final blow to drive out the Spaniards from Borneo. The remainder of the Spanish forces left Brunei in a hurry. They were only able to hold their positions for only 72 days. And as quickly as the invaders left, the Sultan and the people of Cotabato returned to rebuild the capital and resume shipbuilding to revamp their defenses. In the end, the Sultanate of Brunei emerged victorious against the conquistadors and Spain would never again attempt to colonize Brunei. And despite the Sande boasting that they were able to conquer all of Borneo in their letters to the king of Spain, the Sande in reality was only able to capture just the capital of Brunei, one city, and held it only for 72 days before desperately rushing back to the safety within the walls of Intramuros de Manila. They quickly realized their mistake in underestimating what was then the most powerful sultanate 
in the region. In fact, as early as 1579, they tried to renegotiate peace with the Sultan, but the Sultan of Brunei refused to meet with them. And it was only in 1599 that the Spaniards finally signed a treaty with the Sultanate of Brunei. And this also resulted in the resumption of trade between Luzon and Borneo. But unknown to many, including Filipinos, Brunei continued to support their cousins in Luzon against the Spaniards. There were many attempts and plans between Brunei and the Luzones to liberate Luzon from the Spaniards since the fall of Manila in 1571. For example, a decade after the Castilian War, from 1587 to 1588, the Lacans and the Datos of Luzon led a pan-Asian conspiracy to drive out the Spaniards from the Philippines. This epic conspiracy did not just involve the Datus or nobility from the provinces of Luzon, but also the Datus and people from all walks of life from other islands like Sulu and Palawan. It also involved the Japanese and the Sultanate of Brunei. It was a multi-ethnic attempt to liberate Luzon and the other islands of the Philippines from colonialism. And you can learn more about it in my older videos or in my book, Todo Slavery and the Revolt of the Lacans. So check them out after this video. In the video, he also mentioned how the Moro Wars between Spain and the Muslim Sultanates in the Philippines lasted for 300 years until the Spaniards were ousted from the Philippines by the United States. So yes, it lasted 300 years but let's be honest, it was not the Americans who really defeated the Spaniards in the Philippines in 1898. So check out my reaction to the video how the US stole the Philippines to learn more. Now, I've actually been planning on making a series of videos about these conflicts between the Spanish conquistadors and other Europeans against the many different kingdoms and sultanates of Southeast Asia. So let me know what you think in the comments below. In fact, today's topic from the Castilian War, the revolt of the Lacans, and the different wars in Burma, Ayutthaya, Cambodia, Sumatra, and the Portuguese conquest of Malacca will also be part of the bigger book I am working on about the untold history of the Luzones. You know, from Southeast Asia all the way to the Americas. So yeah, keep an eye out. So back to our topic, did the Ottomans really fight the Aztecs in Brunei? Yes, but uh, no. So yes, because there was indeed hundreds of Mexican forces that the Spaniards brought in their invasion of Brunei. But we don't actually really know whether or not they were Aztecs because Mexico is also diverse. You know, they could have been Mayans or even Tlaxcalans or others. But it is true that there's quite a lot of Aztec or Nahuatl loan words you can find in the languages of the Philippines like Tagalog. But that was not because of this war. That was because of the political proximity of the Philippines to Mexico. So the Philippines back then, aka the Spanish East Indies, were directly under the Viceroyalty of Nueva España or New Spain whose capital is located in the city of Mexico and this vast viceroyalty included Central America, North America along with the Caribbean, the Philippines and the other islands across the Pacific. So for over 200 years, almost 300 years, the diverse people of the Philippines were politically and culturally intertwined with the diverse people of Mexico hence why we have a lot in common. It was also said that at some point in our history, the Spanish Spaniards also brought warriors from Peru to fight in the Philippines. So yes, perhaps Incas also fought wars in Southeast Asia. And yes, the Ottoman Empire was very active in the politics of Southeast Asia during this time. And unknown to Filipinos, we actually have a connection to this mighty empire. For example, when the Ottomans were fighting a war in Sumatra to support the Sultanate of Aceh against the Batak Minangkabau forces in the 1530s, the Luzonist warriors were active on both sides of this conflict. In fact, one of their leaders named Sapeto de Raja was entrusted by the Sultan and appointed as the commander of a multi-ethnic army with warriors from what are now the countries of Southeast Asia, India, Turkey, Ethiopia, and more. And he was given the important task of holding the kingdom of Aru in northern Sumatra. Actually, many scholars believe that it was from the Ottomans that the Luzones of the Philippines learned to master the art of making cannons and firearms. In contrast to this colonial myth that our ancestors never had any firearms. When in fact, as we've seen in Manila and Brunei in the 1570s, the Spaniards loved looting the firearms and the other weapons of our ancestors. 
Also fun fact, my own ancestor, Raja Suleiman of Manila, was said to be named after two legendary Muslim kings. The first was his great-great-grandfather, Sultan Suleiman, the benevolent fourth Sultan of Brunei. And the second was after Sultan Suleiman, the magnificent of the Ottoman Empire. So yes, Ottoman warriors and native Mexican warriors were indeed involved in this war in Southeast Asia. But... They were actually just minor characters in this forgotten chapter of history, in this bigger conflict that had a huge impact in the history and to the people of Southeast Asia. Now, throughout the video, he mentions how Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean was a strange place during this time because of all the different ethnicities from the different parts of the world fighting in the many wars in this vast region. But the thing is, this was not really that strange. Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean have always been at the crossroads of many great and ancient civilizations. These multi-ethnic societies, wars, and kingdoms were not unusual. This was pretty common and nothing new to Southeast Asia. The colonizers painted this idea that our islands and our diverse people were disconnected from one another and from the rest of the world, when in fact, we have always been interconnected with the many kingdoms and the ancient civilizations from India to China, Japan, Africa, the Middle East, and many more. Southeast Asia, including the Philippines, was a very diverse place. Place. In fact, when Europe was still in the Dark Ages, Southeast Asia was thriving and our ancestors were welcoming to foreigners. They were not intolerant of other cultures. They loved exchanging ideas. They understood the strength and the beauty of diversity. And I know I did not really talk about the pirates like Limahong or Koksinga or about the Sanglis that were also mentioned in his video, but that's because those will be topics in my future videos. So stay tuned and make sure to subscribe. And also also, comment below if you want to see a more in-depth look into the Castilian War. I mean, I want to share more about this topic, but this video is now way longer than expected. So let me know in the comments below. But anyways, that is it for me today. If you like this video and learned a thing or two, don't forget to like, share this video, comment down below, and please, please subscribe. And don't forget to hit that bell icon so you're not missing out on my future videos. But of course, before we go, today's shoutout goes to Rene and Kashmir from the Philippines, Ezezel from Singapore, Abhishek from India, Datuk Rajo from Indonesia, Azmi from Brunei Darussalam, and of course, special shoutout to my patron, Felix Khan. And of course, many, many special thanks to all my patrons through the years. Thank you for all your love and support in helping me make more videos like this. So for those who want to help me make more videos like this, show your support and please, please be my patron or you can also get a copy of any of my books or coloring books or any of the merch link down below. Maraming maraming salamat po. Daghang salamat. Terima kasih. Magsukol. Dakal pong salamat. See you next time or in Tagalog. Kita kits. Anika pampangan. Bikitix.